Uh, Senator Patricia Rucker is our guest here. She is the chair of the uh, school choice committee in Charleston. Senator Rucker, good morning to you. Good morning. How are you all? We're well. We are well. Uh, do you know, do, do squirrels eat greens or are they kind of like strictly nuts only? I have never seen squirrel feed, but I will tell you that's not something I have ever studied. So <laughs> I don't want to say something and end up being wrong. I, so we have a lot of squirrels in our backyard, and I know because we have yeah. oak trees, and they drop a lot of acorns in the fall, so they have a field day back there then. Oh. But otherwise, I don't I, know what they eat the rest of the year. I, I think it's much more likely the rabbits were with, was feeding the broccoli. You think it was the rabbits then? Yeah, the rabbits and the Probably. deer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, grow, growing up in Venezuela, as you did, what kind of uh, animals did you see mostly running around? Oh, well, as you can imagine, in Venezuela, like we don't have too many squirrels. It was um, birds, mostly birds. Mm -hmm. um, there, we are, we do have part of the Amazon forest, but I didn't live anywhere near that. So mostly, you know, feral cat and dogs and birds is what i remember monkeys are the monkeys come are there, they in there venezuela are, there are monkeys but again that's closer to the amazon forest not really in the suburbs of caracas which is where i grew up <laughs> those suburban monkeys <laughs> <laughs> the mean jungles of caracas yes <laughs> hey thank you to the internet and believe it or not there is actually a website that is called what do squirrels eat Dot org. Oh, yeah? That's a website? <laughs> That's a website, and uh, they say that they do eat greens. Lettuce, chard, kale, spinach, and arugula. If they run across that in the garden, it simply says they will chow down. No kidding. With so a nice they... vinaigrette. <laughs> we learned something new today. Hey, paired with the appropriate wine, that's a great date. <laughs> very, very nice. Uh, Senator Rucker, in the House, they are working on a bill which would eliminate all Social Security taxes uh, in the state on uh, Social Security income, regardless of your income level. We have eliminated, I believe, Social Security taxes for those under $100,000 a year already. Uh, can you tell me uh, about your Senate bill on this? Yes, Senate Bill 347 would essentially do the same thing uh, starting January 1st, 2025. Um, there would be no cap, and therefore all Social Security taxes would then be exempt. Do we know what the cost of that is in regards to revenue? I have not seen the fiscal note on it, and the Senate version of the bill has not moved from its original committee that it was assigned to. Is that unusual, so, or is it just everything's kind of stalled until it's hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, and wait, and then hurry up? Yeah, I mean, I will tell you that when things have uh, a fiscal implication, usually we will know whether or not it's going to pass or not um, based on how quickly it moves because they know that they have to set the budget and that's something that they start working on from day one. So if it hasn't moved in the Senate, it's a very, uh, I guess you'd say, poor indication of the success. So if the... It is still possible. Uh -huh. This week is the last week to pass Senate version and any Senate bills, but it's unlikely. So if the House bill gets through and gets sent to the Senate, would that help move this along, or do you think it's just going to die in the Senate? So, it's, I, again, I don't want to speak, um, you know, like without actually asking the Senate finance chair, but it is possible. It is still, you know, there's still hope. And they may have discussed it and said, we will wait until the House bill um, moves and then take it up from there. But I, there has just been no discussions here in the Senate regarding that bill, except for like the very first week, because the governor announced it as one of the things he wanted to do. So we did discuss it in the first week, and that's when the bill was introduced. And it has a lot of co-sponsors. So that's, that's a good sign, too. My, there's a lot of support for it. My wife's parents lived in the northern panhandle and moved across the border into Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania does not tax Social Security income at the state level, nor pension yeah. income for retirees. And I'm wondering if uh, your, your colleagues are aware of that because that chased a couple of residents out of the state. I am sure that they are aware of it. I will tell you, again, there's a lot of support for it in the Senate. I, 
I'm, I can only say that there has not been discussions I've been privy to. Interesting. Very good. Well, I'm sorry I that's not moving along better. Hmm? Yeah, no, I, I hope it does pass. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gilstrap. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Do, is there a Senate version? My, my news feed has been burning up with this. West Virginia passes, <laughs> and this, the, this headline says, deranged bill that could put librarians in jail. That there's a bill oh, s- yes. that will somehow hold librarians criminally liable if they have obscene materials and, and yet to be defined in the, in the libraries. Are you familiar with this, and is there a Senate version of that? I don't know of a Senate version. Um, I do remember getting hearing about the House version, and I, I believe they've passed it. I, I, I will tell you, of course, that the, you know clearly the media lets you know what their opinion is with titles such as that. Um, we have had that section of code in place forever in West Virginia, and all they did was strike the exception that currently existed for libraries. But that exception that was put in there for libraries and schools, that exception was to protect schools and libraries from books about anatomy or, you know, biology and, and, you know, certainly did not want in a different time and place and culture for that to be considered obscene because, you know, that's information and education. The problem, I think, lies in the fact that there are now so many Books that parents are very much upset about and, and sexual in nature, written specifically for children. And so, therefore, I will tell you that um, I'm not 100% certain this is um, the best approach, but no library or school will be in any danger of, you know, this charge if they don't have books that are explicit and of graphic material, and there is already court cases that pretty much help guide you as to what that is. If you have just books that have sex in it, that's not considered graphic. But if you have books that have illustrations of sexual acts that are really extreme, um, beyond what's normal, Things that uh, the average person is like, whoa, nine-year-old should not be looking at. This is where they may, you know, choose to put those in a restricted area. And honestly, it's the, this law only applies to minors. So it's not keeping those books from being in the library. But they just have to have it where, you know, a minor cannot have access to it. So it would be clearly for adults and not for a minor child. Yeah, I don't know if I've shared on the show or not. My first novel, Nathan's Run, became one of the 100 most banned books in America. Um, the year, the year it, it, it came out. It had nothing to do with obscenity, though. It's just the content and <laughs> yeah. the quality of the writing is what really did that. <laughs> no, it was about there were 409 bad words in it, according to one count. Um, is there an anticipation that, I know it's crazy, the, is there an anticipation that librarians are going to have to read every book in their library in order to make sure that there are no obscene materials, uh, obscene being a relative term to begin with? Actually, I don't think there's any danger of that. There's a particular code for books that have um, those kind of content. So, you know, the Jewish you remember the Dewey Decimal System? I, I do. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a very particular code that books get coded when they have graphic material in it. So, no, this is not asking them to read every single book. And honestly, you know, let's just be fair. Like, this is not an issue with books that have been around for many, many years. Unfortunately, it's becoming an issue with certain books that have been getting published in the last 10 or so years. Um, and that also narrows the number of, you know, things that libraries, librarians should be looking out for. Matt Miller. Oh, good, John. Did you have a follow-up? No, I was just going to say, I'm, I, I really am of several minds on this issue. I mean, obviously, I, I'm a, a First Amendment purist, but then we're also spending public dollars on on reading materials that are targeted, I guess, for children. I don't know if, how this applies to public libraries. But I'm telling you, I get I get really nervous just as as a voter and as, and as a citizen 
when the government starts picking and choosing what books can and, and cannot be re read, um, you know, sort of taking away the, the parental responsibility or the individual responsibility. You know, I was I was reading adult fiction when I was, you know, 10 or 11 years old because the, the kid stuff didn't entertain me anymore. Um, so anyway, I just I, that's, I, that's my I opinion. I get, this stuff makes me very nervous. Yes, I understand how you feel, and I also very much supporter of the First Amendment, but I'd like to remind you, no one is keeping parents from buying whatever books they want for their children, and no one is keeping the libraries from ha also having these books. But when it comes to protecting minors from pornography, obscene, and graphic material, that has been established law in every single state in the United States. It's only a recent phenomenon that some books are being written for children that some find is really starting to go into the that realm and that has not happened before recent times and and it is i can tell you as a parent who loves going to my public library with my children uh, you know i homeschooled my five children we were at the library all the time i want to know that i don't have to be you know right next to them making certain that there's nothing there. I, I mean, I never expect that in the children's section of my public library, there will be books that are talking about child rape, sex with adults. I mean, these kind of things, I just, I'm sorry, I think the average adult understands that is not really appropriate for young children. I think, I think mean, most of us agree with that. And I, I think John even agrees with that at, at his core. I, I think John as a writer is also very concerned about uh, banning of books, uh, unless, of well, course, no, it, unless it's your book, because book. if it, it's your book, it helps generate sales, additional sales. Oh, yeah, being a banned <laughs> book yeah. generated a lot of sales. It and, did. In all seriousness. I, I, I got to remind you guys that this legislation does not ban a single book. Right. And yeah. uh, in reg I think Damon Wright, who's on the Board of Education, posted a, a comment on this, Senator Rucker, and I know this is not your piece of legislation, so I'm not sure exactly how much you are w familiar with the specifics. But I, his point is that this doesn't have to do with an individual paragraph in the book. It has to do with the overall book content. And he said, I think you will find that there will be surprisingly few books banned in, in these under those uh, circumstances. So I don't Again, know. Again, no, one, no one's banning any books. We're just saying, you, yes, you we, will be held liable, just like any adult in West Virginia, if you provide access to graphic and obscene material to minors. Mm hmm. And I think like, I, we can trust our librarians. They know. They know. Sen Senator Rucker, you, you mentioned earlier that, that, that there's already language in bills, you know, in, in this regard, that this, this measure is simply dealing with schools and libraries. Uh, does this bill also add any additional penalties as, as to what the prior laws were? Because I know some of what we heard is, you know, the very large fines in the jail time. Is that kind of already in legislation? I, I, again, it's not my bill, and I will just admit to you that I have not read it. <laughs> it's not <laughs> the not Senate, right? It, it's a House bill. Yeah, okay. it's a House bill. All right. Yeah, so, but I, I, from what I heard about this bill, all it does is strike the exception for schools and li libraries um, from that code. So, no, I don't think it increases p the penalties. It's all existing language. You mentioned this is the week that things have to come through the Senate. Uh, what are some of the major issues that are, are nearing the finish line, and what are some of the ones that you would really like to see get through that, that maybe may not make it past that finish line? Well, thank you for asking that. Yes, this is the last week to get the bills out of the originating house, um, and then the last two weeks you basically focus on the bills from the other so I will tell you, um, I mean, <laughs> I hate to keep bringing up certain bills I've mentioned over and over again here. I've been very pleased with how many of my bills have, you know, passed already. So I, I want to start off by saying that. So great. Thankfully, lots of my bills have gotten through. Some, like I've mentioned in previous years, Rob, um, my bill to add an appeal process to the DMV safety and treatment program. It's not moving, um, just kind of sad and depressing <laughs> for me. Um, I have one bill that I care about a lot, which is clarifying the um, 
but solar farms are not agricultural in terms of taxation. And um, that one is in Senate finance, and um, it was on the calendar last week and then got pulled off the calendar, and I have to find out why because I really do care um, about making that clarification. Even though we call them solar farms, they're not farms. And our taxation for farms, actual true agricultural operations, is the lowest property taxes in the all of our code. And I wanted to just clarify that solar farms don't get that um, classification. Um, I also have a bill that has to do with requiring CPS to give parents a copy of their rights. Um, So when CPS gets involved in these cases, which we have a lot of in the state of West Virginia, there is um, no clear duty for them to let parents know what their rights are. And I have unfortunately heard of too many cases in which because the parents didn't know what they were supposed to do, their children were taken from them, and it made it much more difficult for them to get their children back. And, of course, clearly, we have procedures in place for when, you know, those children need to be taken away from the parents. But we're talking about cases in which it's it's not quite as clear or it's, um, you know, someone calls CPS, says the child is being neglected. The CPS does have procedures to interview and check and make certain that it truly is a, a case of neglect, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So we just want to make certain that parents know what their rights are, and that one is hasn't moved yet. Um, also, my bill that would streamline the HOPE scholarship and uh, codify some of the things that the state treasurer has done and, and just make it easier for parents to understand um, how to use it. That one is also not moving from Senate finance. Um, so those are some of the ones I care about. I don't want to list all of them. Um, I can tell you that it's going to be a very busy week for us. We are going to have extra committees. So there is still time, and we'll see what happens this week. I want to talk to you about your one bill, SB 860, creating alternative high-risk population public charter schools. Can you give me oh, some yeah. details on that? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so that bill, there's a couple of particular charter schools that are focused on children who are failing in the public schools for multiple reasons. Sometimes it's their grades. Sometimes it's because they got pregnant and it's, you know, they're decided to have the child and, and the complications of that. Sometimes it's because they have to work. Um, they're in a situation where their family needs them to be working. And I know you guys have talked about that issue. Um, sometimes it's because of, um, you could say, you know, the circumstances of their life, like these foster children of which we have too many and the trauma that the child has gone through. But these high risk population there are charter schools that focus on that population and they help them recover regain the credits that they need and graduate and they're much more flexible schools they're not they don't even meet every single day so these um, public charter schools sometimes they just meet twice a week for four hours but their focus is helping those struggling students And um, very often in some of these states, and I've actually gone to visit some of these charter schools, they are working with the local schools. So instead of suspending or expelling a student or what happens in many cases, the student just drops out, the public schools uh, basically encourage them to go to these charter schools. And these charter schools just give them a lot more individualized attention and flexibility so that they don't have to drop out of school and so that they get the support that they need. So I want to try to encourage some of those charter schools to consider coming to West Virginia. And so there's a bill that will just let us have that possibility. So what, did you get a fiscal note on this one, Patricia? I, I did not, but there shouldn't be a fiscal note. It, it, they're not going to get paid more just because they are a high-risk population. The type of things I needed to do in order to allow this to happen is clarify that a charter school will 
can have complete and total flexibility in their scheduling and, and calendar. They can meet year round if they want to, for example, um, and clarify that they could, um, they're not going to have to fulfill the requirements of the 180 days. Some of these kids that are in that situation, um, they're just not going to. They're not going to be able to go to school five days a week. So as long as they get the subjects done, they still have to take the same requirements and tests. Um, the idea is let's see if that is something that could help some of our high-risk students in West Virginia. Would it be possible to incorporate this within another charter yes. school that already exists? Yes, it is absolutely possible and it is also possible to incorporate this within our public school system our existing public school system I, i'd like to remind our public schools in our law it allows any and all public schools to adopt the flexibility the public charter schools have if they so choose as you envision this with the these um special need not special needs high risk uh, charter schools is that something people would volunteer to go to and choose to go to, or is it something that people would be sent to in lieu of being suspended? No, it's always um, a choice. Just like all public schools, parents would choose to try this, enroll their child in this. Um, so it's, it's never, ever mandated. It's not like, you know, a boot camp type of school. But I will tell you that um, the schools that I've gotten to visit that are like this, are just amazing. It is so, so uplifting and gives me so much hope when I visit them. And they are much smaller. They're much more, um, you know, like, what do you say? They have this feel of these wraparound services of support. And um, some of these, they're literally in trailers. They're, they're mobile trailers instead of being in an ecstatic building. And they, they bring the trailer to the community in these rural areas and like I said twice a week and the, the so it's where the students are and the students take their classes get the hope and support that they need and then the rest of the week they're working to provide for their families you know like I said in the situations where it's an unwed young mother to be able to get child care twice a week is a lot easier than you know for five days a week and and we, we are really helping kids with it. So I just I just want it to be an option. Do you have to uh, get going to the Senate caucus at 8.30, Patricia? Unfortunately, I do. I was just going to say. <laughs> well, we thank yes. you very much for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Anytime. You guys have a great day. You too. You too. You too.